The Australian Investors Podcast is brought to you by BetaShares, serving over 1 million investors across Australia's broadest range of ETFs. After years of record low interest rates, income-seeking investors have been returning to cash and fixed income ETFs, drawn by the attractive returns on offer. Equity income funds have also been generating healthy income streams. BetaShares provides yield-hungry investors with a range of income-focused funds to choose from, including ETFs offering exposure to cash, bonds, hybrids, Australian shares, and international shares. To explore the BetaShares ETF range, visit betashares.com.au and consider if the fund is right for you. I'm also proud to say that this episode of the Australian Investors Podcast is brought to you by The Intelligent Investor, Australia's premier investment research membership service. You can get a free trial for 15 days, no credit card details required. To access the insights of some of Australia's best analysts, including buy, hold, and sell share recommendations, click the link in your podcast player to secure your Intelligent Investor membership today. This Australian Investors Podcast episode is brought to you by The Intelligent Investor, Australia's premier investment research membership service. You can get a free trial for 15 days, no credit card details required. To access the insights of some of Australia's best analysts, use the coupon code RASK and secure your Intelligent Investor membership today. We're proud to have the Intelligent Investor as an ongoing supporter of the Australian Investors podcast. As a result, RASK does not earn a volume-based fee. Simply head to intelligentinvestor.com.au or use the link in your podcast player to access your free trial. This episode of the Australian Investors Podcast is also proudly supported by SelfWealth, Australia's leading independent broker. Over 120,000 investors trust SelfWealth with over $9 billion in equities. With SelfWealth, you can trade ASX, US, and Hong Kong listed shares for a flat fee. On a $10,000 investment with Comsec, you'd pay $29.95 in fees. Yet with SelfWealth, it's just $9.50. The thing I like about SelfWealth is the full access to fundamental company data and how easy it is to trade US, Hong Kong, and Aussie shares in one place. You can see your Apple shares and ACDC ETF right beside each other. To join SelfWealth now, use the link in your podcast player or head to selfwealth.com.au and use the coupon code RASK during sign-up. Thanks for tuning in to today's podcast. Please remember that all of the information in this podcast episode is limited to general information only. That means the information is not specific to you, your needs, goals, or objectives. So you should seek the advice of a licensed and trusted financial professional before acting on the information. And before you acquire or apply for a financial product, please read the PDS or product disclosure statement, which should be available on the issuer's website. Lastly, please keep in mind that past performance is not indicative of future performance. In this episode of the Australian Investors Podcast, I chat with Amy Lenardi, a buyer's advocate from Amy Lenardi Property, and Chris Bates, co-founder of Wealthful, a mortgage broking firm based out of Sydney. This episode is very special for us, and yes, it's on property, not shares, not bonds, and not anything else that we typically talk about on the show. This episode is special because Chris, Amy, and I have created a free property course for you, for our listeners, and for our community at RASC. You can take this course on the RASC education site by following the link in your podcast player. Even if you're a property investor with 10 or 20 properties, or you're just getting started, this course could teach you a lot. I know I learned a lot from hearing what Chris and Amy had to say. If it's not for you right now, I would encourage you to share the course with friends or family members who are buying property who or who do want to learn about a different asset class. It's a totally free course as part of RASC's mission to educate more Australians. This conversation takes us through the implications of COVID on Australian property, including apartments and houses, where Chris and Amy are buying and where their clients are seeing opportunities and so forth. This is a great primer on property. But again, if you want a bit more knowledge on the asset class that is so important to Australia's economy and to Australian investors, be sure to check out the course. I hope you enjoy this episode of the Australian Investors Podcast with Amy Lenardi and Chris Bates. Welcome to this episode of the Australian Investors Podcast. In this episode, we're talking property with Amy Lenardi from amylenardi.com.au. She's a buyer's advocate based out of Melbourne and Chris Bates from Wealthful, a mortgage broker based out of Sydney, both extremely credentialed in their relevant fields and in property. Chris, 
Starting with you, welcome to the show, mate. Thank you, Owen. Great to be here. Now, you've been on the show before. Um, I know a lot of our listeners enjoyed hearing your insights around how to define investment grade property, um, how to structure a portfolio, and, and principally talk about investment portfolios and how that ties into um, cash and general manage- money management. Amy, it's your first time on the Australian Investors Podcast. You have been with us on the Australian Finance Podcast. Welcome to the show. Thanks, Owen. Good to be here for my first time. Mm-hmm. Yes, we've um, had some dealings in the past, but this is our first time talking about property investing uh, in particular. And um, what we're going to talk about today is the property market 2020 and 2021. Um, the reason why we bring this up now is there's been obviously a lot of lessons learned from COVID. Um, we've seen some uh, changes in the market. I know around me, uh, which we'll get to throughout the conversation, the property market seems to have just gone, uh, to put it coyly, bananas. It's just been a bit wild in my neck of the woods down in southeast Melbourne. So, so thrilled to have this conversation. I think it's timely right now. But why don't we start with introductions? Chris, I'll just throw it over to you. Do you just want to tell us a bit about yourself and a bit about wealth, Wealthful? So I'll keep it short and sweet. I mean, on the tin, I was a financial advisor from 2007 to 2020, so 13 years. But since 2012, um, we shifted from all older clients in their sort of 50s, 60s to working with younger clients. And since then, it's just been younger couples and families. And as a business, we've really sort of created a niche where we use our financial planning mindset um, and a tackle mortgage broking in the completely different way than most mortgage brokers do it. We sit at the front end and really talk clients through what they want to achieve, ultimately what's going to change with their family and where they're going to live, et cetera. Um, And then we really help them make great property decisions. So everything from structuring the loans to picking the right bank, but ultimately also buying a, a great asset. So we work with lots of different buyers agents all over the country, all the local experts um, in different pockets. Um, so we're a mortgage broker, but we do that through a lot of guidance through the property transaction. Um, you know, fortunately, the business has been growing really strongly. So there's a whole team of us here now to help every client. Um, and we got in the top 10 brokers in the country last year. So um, yeah, we're helping a lot of people, which is which is great. Yeah, it's fantastic. You helped me and my partner last year. Um, and you said top Top ten, um, I believe there's about sixteen thousand brokers in Australia, so it's no, no small feat indeed. Um, and I think last time we had you on the show, a few of the listeners followed you up and um, got in touch. So that's great, to, great to know. Amy, uh, Chris just mentioned he works with buyers agents and um, buyers advocates. Can you tell us a little bit more about yourself? Your business is relatively newer. Um, how did that come to be? Yeah, so I've been in the property industry for gosh, nearly a decade now, and started my own business. I used to work at a different buyer's advocacy firm, but I've had my business for, well, it started during the middle of COVID, which was a story in itself. (laughs) Mm. But I've been working with property investors since 2013. And I've worked with such a different range of investors from people who were wanting to get in for more cash flow assets around the $300,000 level all the way through to really strong capital growth properties around $2 million. So I really love sitting down with investors and tailoring a strategy to them rather than the other way around. A lot of people think investment properties is hearing about a great suburb or (laughs) a great area and then just going to buy a property there. That's not how it works. But I'm a I'm a buyer's agent. I'm a fully licensed real estate agent. I'm also a qualified property investment advisor. I have a degree in economics, which is kind of irrelevant, but I mentioned that because I've studied for six years to get into an industry where the entry requirements are actually pretty low. But I love applying those economic theories to what I do and worked with hundreds of investors, but I'm also an investor myself. So I've got a portfolio, I've got a, a mixture of um, capital growth properties, I've got cash flow properties, and I, I also do property development, which I can absolutely assure you is not for the faint heart and it's not for a beginner investor, but it just means I've got that really well-rounded and, and broad expertise when it comes to property. Mm, it's always good to know that the winemaker drinks the wine, Amy, that um, there's, <laughs> you know, we, we, we practice what we preach. Um, before we get into the first talking point, I might actually just um, call out something that we've been working on together, which is a free course on our RASC education site. If you've never bought a property, if you're looking to make your first investment in a property, um, check out the course that Amy and Chris have put together with the RASC team. It's available on RASC education, totally free. 
Um, and it's just a great way to prime you for when you engage with experts like Amy and Chris. So to cover off those basics so you can speak the language of, of property investment. Um, I learned so much doing it. I'm obviously a shares guy, um, fixed interest. You know, these are, the, these are the markets that I tend to play in. So property for me is relatively new. Bought my first property last year. I'd like to think it's investment grade. Having spoken with the two of you, um, so please check that out on Rask Education. So what our, what our listeners um, will be really keen to know is, I guess, how the property market has ebbed and flowed since COVID. I bought a house, um, my wife and I bought a house and it, we, we got the offer accepted the day that Victoria went into stage <laughs> four lockdown. So it was pretty crazy. The banks made, uh, you know, it was a bit of a challenge for us, uh, especially with my background with the business, but it was all pretty, you know, fast and wild, I would say. Maybe we'll start with you, Chris. Um, you know, got a lot of clients in and around Sydney. How have you seen the market shift since COVID hit? I think it's not just um, things that are a one-off sort of thing and things are going to go back to like they were, not in just life, but I think in the property, I think buyer preferences have shifted dramatically and what people are willing to compromise on in 2021 and late 2020 is completely different to what they were willing to compromise on before. We've seen the attitude of you know a lot of first-home buyers and even upgraders um, willing to go further, you know, like we've seen clients, lots of clients move to the Central Coast, but only a handful of clients consider it prior to COVID, the same as north of Wollongong, and even had clients moving up and down the coast to Byron, to Brulee in the south coast, Blue Mountains, etc. So, you know, as you've seen with the results with regional properties, they have gone through the roof, um, especially in certain pockets in those regional. It's not everything in those regional locations. And so I think that has shifted and I don't think it's going to go back. We've also seen clients that potentially um, would have wanted to get a little bit closer to the CBD um, and would have sacrificed on a smaller, say, terrace. Um, they're saying, well, actually, now I'm willing to go to that middle ring if I get a bigger four-bed house, a bit more land. Um, so it's really taking that pressure off the inner ring. Uh, and, and a lot of those buyers are now spreading up and down the coast. Um, but they're always going, they're not just uh, going for lifestyle and they're going for certain pockets of that lifestyle, like literally walking to the beach or views, et cetera. So um, it's been a major, a major sort of shift. I think you've also seen any area in capital cities that was discounted for commute, i.e. the northern beaches in Sydney, has really sort of um, now having a day in the sun, really. They're the areas that are really growing much stronger than the areas that were priced, um, you know, mainly benefit was the commute. Mm, that's something that, you know, I, I've i seen in my area. Um, just young, younger professionals, I would say, is probably if I could generalise Younger professionals coming out from the CBD, um, maybe they were in an apartment, maybe they had that townhouse, and now they're looking for that thousand square metre block. And supply has really dried up in our area. So to put it in context, I was speaking to a real estate agent um, over the weekend, and he was saying that in the 10 suburbs which surround ours, there were 25 homes available in total. And that's what, uh, the equivalent of one for every real estate agent in the area. Whereas in the past, there might have been 50 homes available at, this, at, at any one time. So quite a lot's changed in the area that I'm looking in. Amy, how about you? Have What have been some maybe lessons learned or how are you seeing the, the market shifting um, from a client perspective and from your, from your own observations? Well, just to elaborate on what you've both just mentioned, in terms of stock levels, that is absolutely the current lingering effect from COVID. And that's the reason why the property market didn't drop as much as everyone was anticipating. I remember, you know, these fear-mongering websites and media channels saying, you know, 20, 30 plus percent falls. And of course that didn't eventuate. And the reason is because yes, demand dropped, but supply dropped so dramatically that it absorbed and it was a bit of a, a shock absorber for the market. And we have this lingering effect after COVID where supply just hasn't picked up. And there's a couple of reasons behind that. There's still a little bit of uncertainty, but also if there's nothing for those vendors to buy, then 
they're wanting to wait until they've bought first before they sell, but because they can't find anything to buy, it becomes a bit of this vicious cycle. So at this stage, we're still experiencing quite low stock levels, especially for good quality properties. So yep. quality assets in quality locations, a bit different when it comes to, you know, the high rise apartment market. We'll talk about that a little bit later on. But like you said, Chris, I'm also seeing a lot of changes in preferences for first home buy. So just home buyers in general, including first yep. home buyers, and that is more space, an extra bedroom, a home office, going a little bit further out, especially if they can work from home. I've had some clients say that they want to move to Geelong because now they can work from home and or perhaps only go into the office a few days a week. And I've also had a lot of clients who are just really not able to cope working from home, especially with their mm. partner in their little one-bedroom apartments. So that's changing. We also saw a really big shift last year in terms of first home buyers having a lot of dominance in the market. So a decrease in investors and a resurgence in first home buyers because a lot of them, especially if they weren't impacted by COVID, they saved a lot more money. If the one the ones who had job security thought this is a great opportunity for me. And they also have, um, there's a lot of incentives for first home buyers, especially with this extra 25% stamp duty discount that we've got here in Victoria now. So there's a lot going on there. But if I'm focusing on investors and the key lessons learned throughout COVID, because there was a lot of stressful situations for investors, especially if they had tenants who couldn't pay rent or perhaps they got caught out with a vacant property just before stage four lockdown and they couldn't lease it out really highlighted the importance of a buffer account. And I always harp on about having a buffer account for these emergencies, not expecting COVID to hopefully happen again in the future, but that's what that money is for because your landlord insurance, it doesn't cover certain things and it certainly didn't cover a lot of the loss of rent um, because a lot of you just have to understand what the policies do cover. And for some landlords who are expecting that to, to, to cover them, it it didn't and they got caught out. It also demonstrated the importance of having a really great property manager who understands the legislations and can work with those tenants to work through the really difficult times. And also that properties with low scarcity, and we always yeah. talk about this, Chris, um, those are the ones that have just, you know, fallen by the wayside. The demand from them for both owner occupiers and tenants in particular is really low. They're, they're competing against a lot of vac- other vacant properties. So in a booming market and with really tight vacancy rates, then you know those properties tick by. But COVID really demonstrated why those can be really, really challenging assets from a resale potential, but also a leasing potential. I'm interested. So one of the things, obviously, we talk about a lot on, on this program is the, the impact that interest rates have on real assets yeah. like property. Chris, you know, have you seen people just throwing their hands up in the air and saying, well, I have no other option. It's either the stock market or property. Um, you know, I've got this borrowing capacity. Let's use it up. Uh, yeah, I think when the RBA and we started to get fixed rates sub 2%, it was like a light bulb moment. And um, a good new client, uh, you know, in the funds management world, uh, super successful. And he was very anti-property uh, and couldn't understand the market. You know, works in a lot of people in equities have a different view on how to price assets and ha- find it hard to price property. Um, and his his whole mindset shifted because he realised how rates are going to impact pe- buyer behaviour and and encourage people to take on more debt um, and people can borrow more money. All the responsible lending sort of challenges of 2018 are sort of um, non-existent really anymore. Um, and so, yeah, if other people are going to go and borrow more money and take on more debt because rates are really low, then do you want to bet with that that sort of tide, I guess? And, um, yeah, we've seen a huge mindset shift when we started to see rates sub 2% in five years. So I'm willing to take on that debt because I can afford it. So, yeah, interest rates are one of the huge driver of credit growth. Um, and the RBA don't want to admit it, but they also know it's a huge driver of asset prices. Mm, it certainly seems that way. I mean... Uh- you know, it's, I guess, simple arithmetic. When you're taking 25 basis points off 2%, it's a pretty mm. substantial cut and uh, increases uh, borrowing power. And then also the fact that, you know, those responsible lending laws being wound back, obviously, and then not to mention the, the subsidies that we've seen over the last 12 months. So it's certainly, 
been a, a buyer's market or a seller's market if you if you're selling. But if you if you happen to buy during COVID, um, you know you're very lucky. Like I was, it was fortuitous. It wasn't um, any type of gift on my end. Um, Amy, how about you? I, I remember we spoke last time. We spoke. I think this was the back end of 2020, and um, at least here in Victoria, some people were still in lockdown, and there was occasions where people were buying properties unseen. Um, was that something that you experienced a lot last year? Look, it's something that I would never personally do. So I certainly didn't do that for any of my clients. And I did hear about people buying sight unseen. And that was mostly people who are in an absolute bind and they had to buy something because perhaps they'd sold and they didn't want to rent. That being said, they couldn't look at the rental properties as well. So some people did ultimately make decisions to do that. And there's a there's a lot of risk involved there, of course, especially because they then couldn't get a building inspection done. So I absolutely would never endorse it. There were people taking up rental properties because that's obviously less of a commitment. But gosh, stage four here was just absolutely awful. And, you know, for the real estate market, I know that, um, you know, for me, I, I mean, I couldn't work for 10 weeks, but then when everything opened again, there was this pent up demand. You had a lot of people who were had a lot of time during stage four lockdown to start researching to get their pre-approval in place and to really get ready so that when we opened, there was quite a flurry of activity and that has that's definitely filtered through to 2021 as well. It's um I remember going to so when there was that window here in Victoria of lockdowns, um I remember going to some some properties and some of the, the agents would tell me, yeah, we've had 120 groups through today. And, you know, that's 120 groups, people inspecting the property. We're talking about, you know, people, this huge amount of demand, really efficient pricing in those situations because it's just no matter where you go, it's a bidding war. Amy, you, you told us, um, you told Kate and I on our Australian Finance podcast earlier today that in, last year there were actually a lot of properties, and you were seeing this as well, a lot of properties being sold pre-market or that were just simply off market um, and you were seeing those come through and those were potentially where more of the opportunities were coming from. Uh, absolutely. Last year, and this is not this is not normal, but last year I bought in excess of 60% of my clients' properties off market or pre-market. So those are properties that weren't advertised on the internet. I'd say around half of them as well were ones that only I had access to. So we had the exclusive right to negotiate on them. But if you're a property buyer and you don't have access to these types of properties, then you're missing out on a large portion of the market. And during COVID, because there was so much uncertainty and vendors were really hesitant about committing to going on the internet because there are costs involved in going online. There's the cost to put the, in, the property on, on realestate.com.au or domain. There's the cost to style it. And if they weren't confident about being able to sell that property, then they just were a bit uncomfortable about paying those costs. And as much as the real estate agents were telling them it was actually not a bad time to sell and they were correct, of course, vendors were listening to the media and listening to, you know, friends and family who were saying, no, just wait, just wait. So last year, lots of off markets, lots of pre-markets. This year, I expect that to come down to more of my look normal long-term average, which is around 30%. But I, what, you've, what you'll find is that the busier agents become, so once supply starts to pick up, if slash when it does, then there's going to be more off-markets around just as a general proportion of properties available. Mm. But also when agents get busy, they are more likely to be happy to do off-market and pre-market deals, especially when they're starting to fill out their auction schedules. Once you start to see Thursday night auctions and Sunday night auctions, you know that that's starting to happen. <laughs> okay. So this is about getting on their list, speaking to the agents before and just getting really on their, their, their private newsletters because by the time it hits domain or real estate, that's on market, right? So Correct. Um, yeah. You've got to be okay. super proactive with it. And it's not just telling the agent once off what you want and hoping they're going to remember yeah. you. They're dealing with hundreds of buyers. So it's making sure that you give them really clear and specific metrics of what you're after. Some examples would be great for them to have a tangible example, but also then touching base with them. I'd say once a fortnight, 
I touch base with agents more frequently just because I'm talking to them all the time anyway. Mm. Once a fortnight, call or email, super quick, super polite, just to remind them that you're there and that you've got your pre-approval, you're ready to go and you're a serious buyer. Never say to an agent, oh, I'm just looking or I'm not quite ready yet, I'm not in a rush. They're not going to put you to the top of their list if you say that. Mm. And this is one thing that we're looking for, you know, in the stock market, we're looking for these opportunities where everyone else isn't looking, you know, that's how you get an edge, an informational advantage is you're trying to find um, stock in this case, or assets in, um, you know, on the other side of the fence, you're looking for these assets that, you know, the, the, the average investor isn't willing to look at or hasn't found out about yet. So you can get the, the, the asset for the price you like. Chris, we mentioned responsible lending laws um, and being wound back, um, pretty contentious issue, especially following the Royal Commission. Um, how, how are you seeing that impact clients coming through? And um, I imagine it's it's a bit easier on your end. We don't know exactly what's going to happen yet because it's you know still hasn't been legislated exactly what's going to happen. But ultimately, the banks are lending like they were you know, 2012 to 2017 with, you know, and a lot of banks are dialing back how much they're looking at your living expenses, which was the big the big issue that caused the 2018 downturn where banks freaked out because they weren't sure whether they could potentially get sued in the future if you default on your loan, if they hadn't verified the living expenses. So could we see um, a real relax and lending go ballistic? I don't think so. I think we may see borrowing capacities rise a little bit. Um, which it's already happened because assessment rates have fallen. But um, there might be some great product innovation coming out of the changes to help first-home buyers, you know, no LMI. There might be great innovation for retirees and, um, you know, reverse mortgages for them. So I think that will be a lot of the benefits of these sort of newer rules, um, potentially new players in the market, more competition, better for consumers, et cetera. The, the negative of potential rule changes is it does potentially not protect people who don't know what they're doing with financial and financial literacy is very low in Australia um, and it could uh, create people who are going to get problems with debt um, down the line and, and destroy their financial future. So that's why we need that consumer protection. Um, but what the Liberals want um, and what the property industry wants and developers want is a relax of um, restrictions so we can lend more money and, and push up the property market. So it is a, con- a really contentious issue. Um, you've just got to be educated when you are and how is this going to affect your situation and your friends and your family and those you care about. It's something that we see so much like on the equity side. Um, it's almost you know never a good idea to to use debt or leverage in my opinion. But then you know on the property side, it's obviously inherent in the system and pricing. You know credit availability is effectively the mm. ticket. So it's a really interesting one and one we'll watch from or I'll be watching from the sidelines for now. Chris, we might keep stay with yeah. you for a moment because you're um, based around Sydney. Um, where are you seeing opportunities in 2021? And I and I bring this up, you know, I know it's horses for courses and it depends on the clients, but um, I know you monitor the the market very closely. Yeah. You've got the Elephant in the Room podcast, so I'm just saying, just just as a general, I guess feel of what you're seeing in the market in and around Sydney. So we're just back to that sort of first point about buyer preferences. I think you're going to really see this dislocation between homes and apartments and things that really suit families and growing families and home offices and that type of property, um, the goods and things that are compromised like busy roads or dark, before people would just buy them because they wanted to be in that suburb because they just had to minimise the time travel to and from work so they could spend more time with their family. That isn't going to potentially be as long as the work from home sort of thing does change to a couple of days a week for most organisation, which seems like it's going to be the case. So I think that areas that are being discounted because of commute, but every other box is amazing. You know, great lifestyle, great to bring up a family, great access to nature and good schools and nice looking properties and, all, and you know, demographics that are, you know, that sort of higher income growth and professionals and et cetera. So, you know, we are seeing it up and down the coast a little bit. You've got to be a little bit careful because these markets have already gone super hot. So, you know, you could potentially have seen 20, 30% rises in Central Coast, you know, north of Wollongong. Um, so you, you might be a little bit too late. You know, for example, Byron ticks a lot of boxes, but it's gone up 30, 40% even more in some properties. So um, that to me is areas that have been discounted from the commute. So houses potentially a little bit further away from the train station before, you know, the ones, you know, 10 minute walk were super well priced but because the train mattered so much but maybe a little bit further from the train station is better value now and maybe a bit more land so i think that's the 
the real thing. I think you've got to be really careful right now buying things traditionally that investors have bought, off-the-plan apartments, um, apartments in high-density areas, you know, duplexes, things that are high positive cash flow, um, et cetera. I'd be really, uh, this is always the case. It wasn't just in 2021, but I'd be buying things that aspirational, you know, higher income, young couples and families want to buy um, and want to live in and own. Um, ultimately, they're the ones with the biggest borrowing capacity and they're the ones that are going to compete on property the most. So if you're an investor, you want to buy something that targets the owner-occupied market that higher income couples and families really want. Um, generally, it's things that are, are three beds as well because um, that's where there's a real shortage in our capital cities is two beds, there's lots of options, but three beds, there's just an inherent undersupply. So that's our sort of investment tip. Also, don't go down a quantity strategy. Just buy one top quality asset. Um, don't go and buy three or four properties. It's a bit of a, a belief. It's a number of properties you won't know. It's it's the quality of your assets, and one's better than many, I believe. Mm. When you said um, 20 30% in Byron, are you talking about uh, year over year? Are you talking since COVID? What, what time frame is that? Not sure exactly how big the Byron shy they're using, but... Uh, you only have to look online and see some of the crazy prices. Um, you know, I follow a buyer's agent up there and just listening to some of the stories that he's been sharing. Um, the market's gone absolutely ballistic and, um, you know, for obvious reasons because of uh, everyone wants to live there, but they haven't been able to do it because of the confidence around um, just society's perception. Even if you run a business, do you think you can still run that business and clients will accept you moving to somewhere like Byron and working virtually? Before 2020, I don't think you'd have the guts to do it. In 2021, a lot of business owners go, well, yeah, clients are still going to engage me even if they only have to deal with me virtually. Just one more follow-up question there. You're saying, you know, that the stock, the three betters are probably most scarce and least relative to two betters. How about now with that work from home movement? Um, are you seeing like more emphasis placed on four bedrooms simply because there's one that is now permanently in office? Yeah, for sure. Like we've had clients that have bought in 2019 uh, and sell in 2020 because um, they went, they, they, in 2019, they had to get somewhere close to the city. So they bought a semi in a great suburb. In 2020, they're going, well, you know what, let's go for the big four bed in the middle and outer ring, we get a lot more value for our money. And so mm -hmm. I do think that um, space is much higher on people's priorities. And so if you have got to say a smaller terrace, it's three bed, there's not a, a kind of space to have an office. I do think they're the ones that are going to struggle compared to say the next door neighbour that's maybe a bit wider terrace. It's a four bed and there is a bit more room. I do think that the performance over the coming years is going to be uh, much better in the bigger sort of terraces. And I think you've got to be really careful. The people... Before it was always like if you get a quality asset in in a ring, you'll be safe because of scarcity. I think um, a lot of the C's and D's in these premium suburbs, um, A, they don't go well through downturns like 2018. They really struggled. Everyone's just be patient and they wait for that better property on a better street. But I also think longer term people are going to go, well, I don't really want to just compromise that much. I'd rather move the next suburb. Um, and so I think you're mm -hmm. going to see this, the gap between the best property in a suburb and the worst property in a suburb, even if it's the same asset, a house, that divide's going to get bigger, I believe. Throwing it over to you, Amy, um, down here in Melbourne like me, are you sharing similar sentiments to Chris or are you seeing, like where are you seeing opportunities down here? I'd love to talk about this word opportunity from an investment perspective because I think there's a lot of myths when it yeah. comes to property investing that you yes. should look for areas that are like hot spots or there's a myth around, um, you know, you go where population's increasing, but population doesn't actually equal capital growth. Just means there's more people there, but unless their incomes are growing, and like Chris said before, without income growth, you can't have capital growth, then sometimes investors focus on the wrong thing. And you, this is especially relevant in areas where all of a sudden they build a new estate. So if you look at the data on paper, the population yep. is going to increase significantly there, but prices might not change. If anything, they might not they might go down because there's this new estate mm. and there's an oversupply. And then there's another in investment myth where, you know, if there's a new road or a new train station being built, well, that that's going to increase in value. But why do people actually want to live there? And are their incomes growing in value? Yeah. Or are they only living there because they can't afford to live anywhere else? Those are the suburbs that we don't want to be looking at. So when we talk about opportunities, I think the most important thing is just to come back to the fundamentals. And when you're investing in property, you need to actually figure out your investment strategy first and then the property and location second. 
Mm. And when I talk about investment strategy, when I'm sitting down with a client, I'm looking at things like, well, what's our budget and what are our funding options? So is that money coming from cash or equity? How much do we want to spend? What are our cash flows? So once the rent comes in and all of the expenses go out, how much per month are we happy to contribute to that property pre-tax? What's the investor's risk profile? Do they want something to value add or set and forget? What What's their um, personal preferences and what's their portfolio yep. existing and their future goals and values? See how there's so many moving parts there? Look at that and I chat with them and then I say, well, I think that this location and type of property will achieve that strategy and achieve your brief rather than saying, well, you know, look at this suburb. It's had 20% growth. Let's just buy that. It's not the way property investing works. So we're putting strategy before we're putting location. Are you seeing any, I guess, commonalities, any themes in what people are looking for? You know, that office, um, at least in, in my opinion, is you know a must have nowadays. Well, maybe a year ago, it was kind of just like the bonus, if you like. It's definitely becoming more of a preference to have that little bit of extra space or more of a yard apartments. And, you know, I'm, I'm on the same vein as Chris in that I'm not a massive fan of apartments. When it comes to investing, and this is more those high density ones in suburbs, which have a lot of apartments and there's low scarcity, the ones in the more blue chip suburbs and boutique blocks for owner occupiers, I'm not averse to them. But for investors, I think it is important to get a bit of land. And COVID has actually shifted preferences for a lot of tenants as well as owner occupiers. Mm -hmm to having that bit of outdoor space. Mm. You had people who were stuck inside, especially in the middle of winter last year. So values and tastes and preferences have changed. And if I'm looking at uh, in terms of, you know, tree changing and people considering other options outside of Melbourne, an area which I've been um, buying for investors for a really, really long time and I'm continuing to do so is Geelong. I absolutely love Geelong. Been yeah. uh, used to be able to buy a double front there for four hundred fifty thousand dollars when I bought my first um, client's investment property in twenty sixteen, and that has certainly changed now. Mm. But we've got you know nearly four hundred million dollars of federal, state, and local um, government money and investment going into that Geelong and Great Ocean Road area, and we've also got that first stage of the Geelong Fast Rail, which has been announced, and that's. Um, aiming to deliver a 50-minute travel time between Geelong and Melbourne. I don't know if we're getting Wi-Fi on that just yet. I think that will be a game changer. If we're looking at, say, the sub circa mid-8s in terms of a investment strategy, I am buying for a lot of clients there because the fundamentals are good and I can only see them getting better and stronger over time. I know some friends who have bought down there recently for that for that purpose and, and looking at that commute to the city, it's not not going to be nearly as difficult as it was in the past. Absolutely. And there's a lot of, there's a lot going for Geelong. You have um, an amazing, you've got the beach, you've got great hospitals, great schools, you've got a really established shopping centre, activity centre, Packington Street, which is where all the trendy stuff is. So you're in Geelong, you've got really no reason to go back to Melbourne unless you've got friends or family there or your workplace there. But Geelong in itself has just so much lifestyle and amenity that it offers and it's just becoming more more trendy and you know more vibing as the years mm. go by so that's there's a lot of um there's a lot of reasons why people are moving down there and investing there too. Absolutely, it seems like Geelong and Byron both have good surf, so maybe <laughs> that's um, maybe that's a factor that we need to focus on. Chris or Amy, maybe I throw it to you, Chris first. Um, you know, we're hearing some pretty scary stories about the apartment markets. We've both, or all of us, have touched on it now. Um, is there, I guess, an end in sight? I'm look, walking around Melbourne and there's high rises everywhere. It seems, and people going to, um, you know, to, for tenants going to to properties, they're the only one that the agent is showing through, whereas maybe two years ago there'd be 15 or 20 people going yeah. through. I mean, I've been at anti sort of high density apartments for as long as I can remember. Um, I just don't think they stack up, you know, growing supply and demand that hits the affordability in a lot of investors. So what you saw is that when the investors sort of pulled out of the market and just understanding the sort of construction industry and how development works and where it goes in different pockets, et cetera, there is two types of apartments. There is that high density, which you know Amy also you know spoke about, and then the more established premium apartments that are usually older and bigger um, in areas where they're not building more apartments. Um, 
and that owner occupiers really love, especially the downsizers and, and where houses are really expensive, you know. So if it's a Mossman or a Rose Bay, Balmain East or in Melbourne, it might be, you know, Camberwell or, you know, premium suburbs where houses are really expensive. Yet yeah, those apartments will hold value better. Um, but I do think the three bed apartments, which there's not that many of them, will still do really well. Um, but a lot of the other apartments, because buyer preferences have changed, investors have all the apartment issues have come out, um, building issues, university students, cuts of migration. So a lot of investors have been burnt that way as well. Um, and so they're not going to go back. So I, I do, I can't really see the end in sight really because I just think there's more supply coming and the demand's nowhere near going to be as strong. A lot of first-time buyers would buy these apartments because there was this real pressure cooker. But even there saying, look, you know what? I'll move down to Cronulla. I'll move to the Central Coast. They're not just buying that two-bed apartment just because they're desperate. So, um, yeah, personally, um, if you've got one of these apartments, things don't won't just always go back to how they were. You know, you've got to really face the facts of where things are today and the opportunity cost is if you don't do something with it. So um, we see a lot of people come to us who have got those apartments and we have real frank conversations and say, well, look, are you just delaying the inevitable? Can we get you a better alternative if you move on, release that borrowing capacity and go and get yourself a great investment property, which is what you tried to achieve when you first purchased that property, but it didn't work out. I've got to admit, I, I don't think I've ever heard good stories from people buying apartments, at least not the, the you know one to two bed variety. Amy, where, I guess this is the question that never seems to go away, is where are people turning to for income? In the past, you might be able to buy one of these apartments um, and there would be a pretty consistent yield. Where are people looking? Yeah, and that is one of the reasons why investors looked at the more high-rise apartments because the yields were very good and sadly, like Chris has mentioned, they're not going to recover for a long time because the vacancy rates are so high because we don't have that migration. When people move to Australia, they'll often move straight into the city. They'll rent out in Melbourne or Sydney until they get their bearings plus the lack of international students and we've got a lot of um, young people who have also moved back home too. So it's going to take some time for those areas to recover. In terms of getting more stronger yielding properties, uh, you, you really have to start looking at regional cities and areas which have just a higher proportion or a higher rental floor in comparison to the purchase price. Now, if you have a super healthy up super healthy LVR and a really high deposit, then anything can be positive cash flow. <laughs> but if you're looking at <laughs> if you're looking at, you know, borrowing from equity, especially if you're borrowing a hundred or hundred and five percent, then it is quite challenging to get strong cash flow and positive cash flow if you still want to get a little bit of growth. Just understanding that as a very general rule of thumb, there's an inverse relationship between capital growth and positive cash flow. So as an investor and as figuring out your investment strategy, you're figuring out where you fit on that spectrum because there's no point in having amazing cash flow if you've got no growth, but you actually could potentially be a bit negatively geared. You're actually missing out there. You're not being aggressive enough. But on the flip side, there's no point being so aggressive with the negative gearing that it limits your other investing and your savings and your eating baked beans. So as an investor, figuring out where you sit on that investment spectrum and then figuring out a location to fit within that brief. Mm. And this is just such that, that the hard thing for portfolio management, whether you're a professional or you're managing your own investment portfolio um, across all asset classes, income is the thing that people uh, aren't seeing much of these days. And um, in the past, maybe people turned to property. Um, it started as you know capital growth. Maybe they tried to transition that into cash flow or yield. It doesn't really seem to be simple nowadays with interest rates so low. Well, the um, interest rates are so low now that the cash flows yeah. for properties are actually better because less of your cash flows are going towards interest. And if I look at my portfolio and um, – so a lot of my clients, especially who purchased quite a while ago, mm. a lot of those portfolios are now turning positively cash flow. Uh, my Two of my properties have recently changed since my fixed term um, interest loan expired and, and now it's um, on variable. So that's really, that's really great for me. But it also just, um, it also means that you need to understand that over time, especially if you are starting to put more money in your offset account or if you're in an area that's enjoying rental 
increases, which, um, you know, we haven't had in a while, but it does happen, then you can have a negatively geared property that in the future will become positively geared. Mm -hmm. So perhaps if you can sustain that negatively gearing for a period of time, then that might be a strategy that you consider. And that's the thing. I, I, I was framing it more so from people thinking about it now, but obviously those who have bought in the previously um, are enjoying this time. Okay, great. Well, this is a, has been a pretty um, concise overview of, I guess, the state of play uh, in Australia, particularly in Melbourne and Sydney. Obviously, that's where you guys are based, Amy in Melbourne, Chris in Sydney. Amy, I think we have to have you back on the show to do a more um, in-depth look at how you value properties, how you uh, build those portfolios from the ground up. But Chris, always a delight to chat with you too, mate. So Chris from Wealthful, a uh, mortgage broker based in Sydney, um, helped me out. Um, can't speak highly of him enough. Uh, and Amy Lenardi from amylenardi.com.au. You can check out her. She's got a podcast um, available as well um, and lots of things in the works. And these two fine experts helped the RAS team and I build a course, a free course that's available on RASC Education alongside our value investing program and all of the other courses that we do on the equity side um, and on the superannuation side. So please go ahead and enroll in those uh, courses completely free. Um, it's all part of our move to try and get more financial literacy in Australia. So maybe Amy, thank you as always for taking the time out to join me on the podcast. Thanks Owen. Looking forward to next time. Mm -hmm. And Chris, always a pleasure, mate. Thanks for, thanks for everything. I know you've got a bit of landscaping going on, so we appreciate you taking the time out today. <laughs> thank you Owen. I hope there wasn't uh, too much rumbling in the backyard, but uh, yeah, I think just for investors, just really take it quite seriously and understand Property is a capital growth asset. It's not a high yielding asset. Um, for, and that's what you want to be buying when you're buying property. If you want high yield, you know, putting my financial planning hat on, there's way better assets out there you can buy that can provide liquidity and a better yield. And so buying property, a lumpy asset for, for rent that you've got to pay fully, full tax on and maintenance just doesn't make sense to me. So you want to buy assets that got amazing capital growth over the longer term. So anyway, I just thought I'd throw that in there. Oh, I'm sorry. I like it, mate. Thanks for your time on the podcast Cheers. today, man. Thanks for listening to the Australian Investors Podcast, which is proudly supported by JP Morgan Asset Management. JP Morgan Asset Management provides opportunities to strengthen and diversify investment portfolios through alternative income strategies with the JP Morgan Equity Premium Income ETF or ASX JEPI, J E P I, currently the world's largest active ETF with assets under management of US $25.49 billion as at the 16th of May 2023. For more information, you can visit the JP Morgan Asset Management website by visiting am.jpmorgan.com slash au. That's am.jpmorgan.com slash au.